So I went to my master's uh, program and I started going to the classes and I quickly learned I was one of only a few men in the classes. I don't know what happened, but while I was sitting there, I was just reflecting on this idea of men not asking for help. And I asked myself, where did we get this from? And is it real? Is it true? And then I asked myself, is it possible that maybe the fact that men don't ask for help is not actually true? Mm. And the issue is that we haven't done a good enough job creating spaces for men. Hey, Eric, thank you so much for doing this and for being here. Can you please introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about what you do for your work? And then we can kind of get into our discussion. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me. So I'm a registered psychotherapist and a certified sex addiction therapist. My name is Eric Pierney, uh, and I own a mental health clinic here in Toronto, Midtown Toronto, but actually we serve uh, men across Ontario. And the name of the clinic is called Men Therapy Toronto. And it's basically uh, a space that I've created uh, for men to feel safe to kind of, you know, do their individual psychotherapy work. And we also run a, a really popular eight week men's group. It's a healthy sexuality and a healthy masculinity men's group. We actually run it three times a year and we've been doing it for five years now and it's quite popular. So, um, and we have a team of uh, psychotherapists on the uh, on, uh, on the roster. Right on. Thank you. I, I had the thought or I forgot to ask you about that group because there are people that I'm like, you need a group and they're scared <laughs> to go to other groups and I should send them to you. So I got to remember to do that. Um, that. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit about your history into all of this, why you're doing this work, because I think there's certainly a need, massive need for bringing therapy to men. I always share something you told me a while ago about your introduction to it. I don't want to say it because you may say it, uh, but can you tell us a bit more about, yeah, what drew you to the work and kind of how you see it being of service to, to men or people in general? Yeah. I mean, the men's part of what I do, that, that came literally, I think, the first week that I was doing my master's degree uh, in psychotherapy. I was kind of naive in the sense of I didn't realize the kind of gender breakup of, you know, this kind of field and profession. So I went to my master's uh, program and I started going to the classes and I quickly learned I was one of only a few men uh, in the classes. And I don't know what happened, but while I was sitting there, I was just reflecting on this idea of men not asking for help. And I asked myself, where did we get this from? And is it real? Is it true? And then I asked myself, is it possible that maybe the fact that men don't ask for help is not actually true? Mm. And the issue is that we haven't done a good enough job creating spaces for men. And the way I thought about it at the time was I just thought, well, in today's environment, the majority of the psychotherapists and the psychologists are women. So let's say it's 80, 90%. And then any man who's gone to kind of a stereotypical or more typical uh, psychotherapy clinic, there's a kind of feeling in the clinic. And I asked myself, what it was if it was the inverse? What if 90% of the clinicians or 80% of the clinicians were men? I said, how many women would feel comfortable going into that environment? And I think it's always really important when I share this, that I don't think that gender has any play in the efficacy of treatment, right? So it doesn't matter about whether you're seeing a male or female therapist. This is about the client's comfort level, about if they want to go see a male or female therapist. And then I realized that if men did want to go see male therapists, that space wasn't really accessible to them. And that was the kind of genesis. Then I started, that was really early in my master's degree. And then from there, I started kind of doing my research into 
kind of the more specific nuances of men's mental health. So for example, with trauma, how does it affect men differently? What is a different type of trauma that happens uh, with men? And that was kind of the genesis for Men Therapy Toronto. And so that was originated in like 2012, completed the degree, and then the clinic opened in 2016. Yeah, I love that. Uh, is it true that men don't ask for help? It's mm -hmm. such an interesting question. The story that I often share with people, and I don't think I've ever had someone not have a sort of insightful, positive reaction to it. I think you told me, or you, you and now, I, I don't know how to say this, analogized it or put it in this way of, you know, think about, a, I can't remember if you use the word like a blue collar, but like a typical kind of masculine-esque man walks into a therapy clinic and sees flowers and smells incense or something like that. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. what am I doing here kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, and that, yeah. that was the experience that it's like usually the little water fountain, the Reiki right. rocks, the crystals. <laughs> right? And usually yeah. the guy's like, did I fuck up my life this bad that you know, <laughs> this is where I'm at? Right? And, and so the, and the parallel to that would be you know, imagine it was primarily men who were clinicians and they had motifs of warriors, of champions, right, about right, conquering right, your demons, right. you know, getting over your traumas with that type of language. And a woman has to be in that mm, office mm, sitting mm. there. Right? I don't think it would be, you know, entirely comfortable. That was the, yeah, the genesis. Yeah, that's a great uh, sort of balance, like the other side of that situation, which is totally true. Okay. And then, and then you kind of got more and more into that. I actually interviewed someone recently who specializes in male sexual abuse, like childhood male sexual abuse. And he, uh, Rick, Rick Goodwin? no, he, uh, Merle Yost. I know he's from California oh, okay. somewhere. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But he was talking about similar. He reflected on that idea of, men or even boys are not socialized in some sense to ask for help. And so a lot of their, when they have sexual trauma or any other terrible things happen to them, that ethos, and I don't know if it's totally true, but there is obviously components of this where they expect themselves to kind of suck it up and handle it and deal with it. I, I have that conversation with people often too, not in reference to abuse, in reference to how do we balance that idea? And I'm curious how you think about it. How do you balance the idea of, you know, there is some value in sucking it up and, and carrying on. How do you balance that with, and also there are situations where that makes it so much worse, or how do you see that coming out in, in maybe in a male way or, you know, as a, as a generalization? I mean, I don't think there's any value in kind of sucking it up and kind of moving on with it. That's just from my perspective. Anytime I'm working with clients, I'm always really, really like genuinely really clear about if there's anything that they want to get out of their work with me. It's just the idea of you being able to do this alone is just impossible, right? It, it, and it, I really believe that. And I'm always very kind of candid that that doesn't mean either with me or with another therapist. It could be with a good friend. It could be with a spiritual advisor. It could be with whoever, right? And so, you know, sucking up and going alone could kind of, uh, you know, make you move forward because you got to move forward, right? But I don't think it's going to get you to the place of, let's say, healing or feeling of peace uh, that you're looking for. And so, you know, I, that that's how I kind of approach it that to make sure that we have the space for men to be able to uh, stop sucking it up and kind of trying to do it on their own. Right. Yeah. Thanks for the distinction. I, when I think of that, I mean more, you're annoyed that the line at the grocery store is going to take 10 minutes and you're getting impatient and et cetera. It's like, sometimes we just need to suck up things like that. I don't mean in terms of trauma or, okay. or deeper, yeah, deeper emotional things, more like the whining and the, in the un, unnecessary suffering that we cause ourselves uh, by, by not accepting things for how they are. I guess that's how I see it. Um, but yeah, definitely the distinction between trauma or even just addressing like severe suffering that you can't do alone. I definitely agree. Maybe this isn't exactly the right question to ask for the audience. Maybe it's more selfish in your work with, with people, because I often say that as well, you can't do this alone. 
I don't even think one-on-one -on -one therapy is enough for many people yeah. in particular yeah. uh, situations. How do you help people discover what that means, not alone? So you already gave an example of whether it's me, a friend, a spiritual advisor, et cetera. Yeah, I guess how do you or how do you see people discover that on their own and what does it look like for them in their lives? Does that question make sense? Is it specific enough? Not entirely clear, but I mean, I want to make the distinction about when when I'm referring to not doing it alone. You yeah, know, and I tell people all the time it's it's not about like talking to somebody. It's about if you're willing to be gutturally honest about what's going on inside you. That's the only kind of barometer. Now, who you decide to do that with, and obviously, I do not advocate you know, going on YouTube and, you know, or, or doing <laughs> yeah. uh, like doing a social media post about, you know, yeah. your childhood like that. I do not, I, that's not going to help at all. It's going to, in my opinion, make things worse, but yes. someone that you feel safe, you know, and you make the decision that, Hey, there's things I'm holding on to. And I, I don't necessarily mean trauma. It's just how you feel, how you feel about yeah. yourself, how you feel about whatever part of your life, maybe your sexuality or something like that, that's bothering you about how you use it or what you do with it. You know, and so it's that it's creating those connections that I think is ultimately going to lead somewhere into where they want to be to where they want to be. Because I have a lot of clients that, you know, they'll read all the materials and they intellectually understand everything, which is great. Right. But it's not going to do anything to reduce your shame and how you feel only till you have another person hear what you have to say and they don't bat an eye and they care for you regardless uh will that kind of induce or produce some type of change at least that's how i feel yeah uh, to touch on that a little bit and maybe i should have said this at the beginning and i probably will say it in the preamble when i record that i trained with you you were my teacher and my you know, my boss and my guide and and i learned so much from you um thank you one another thing you said to me, I remember, which always stucks with me, and when I say it to people as well, they respond to it. You said something along the lines of, "We're in the shame reduction business, and shame likes to hide, and we're trying to practice bringing shame out of hiding." And I think that's sort yeah. of similar to what you just uh, expressed. Um, any, I guess, is there more context to that, or how do you see that whole idea um, in our job at helping people? Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, I use a metaphor that you may have heard before, but I, I find it helpful, right? Because like what, what shame is as an environment, it's a feeling, but I mean, it's basically an environment that you believe to be true, but you can't see it. And so the metaphor I like to use is like a fish born in polluted water. That fish will feel unhealthy, but will have no understanding of what's driving that. And if you would see that fish at the bottom of the ocean, it'd be swimming around trying to do so many various things to get healthy, but it can't because all it knows is that environment in that water. The only thing that can help that fish, if someone else comes in and says, hey, dude, the water you're in is polluted. You got to get out of here. We got cut off a little bit around the, the shame stuff. You gave the fish and water analogy dirty water um, and how people can help, or, or I guess you described like without other people pointing out to us or asking us questions about that water, I guess, yeah. right? It's so hard for people to see outside of it, right? Yeah. And well, they, they won't ask about the water. The more you reveal yourself to them, they're going to be able to see ah, that nice. oh, yes. the, way yes. you're the way you're looking at things implies right. there's right. some dirty water there. All right. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And then Maybe also, yeah, for time, I know we sort of, time is always the, the challenge. Can you, I guess, describe how sex addiction stuff became, like, that's one of the focuses of the clinic, obviously not the only one, but how did that, how do you see all of that? And why is it so hard for people to get help for that stuff? Or why is there also limited expertise around that and maybe i'm assuming that but yeah yeah i mean so the genesis of that is really you know as soon as i started focusing 
on men's specific work, mm -hmm. right? It became clear that a lot of kind of the pres the presenting concern shows up with sexuality. So let's take something like uh, male sexual abuse, which is the numbers are around one in six, which is basically about, you know, 60 to 100 million men around the globe, you know, have experienced male sexual abuse. Now, 80% of men who identify as having compulsive sexual behaviors will also report having sexual abuse. But nobody leads with that. Often the men don't even recognize it as such. I can't tell you the number of times I've had clients report, you know, being 12, 13, 14 years old and having sex with a young 20s, you know, woman and not see that at all as sexual abuse. They saw it as, wow, they got so lucky that they were taught early on, right? But what they do see that troubles them is how come I can't stop compulsively engaging in either pornography or paying for sex, they can see that, but they don't see the other part, right? And so I quickly realized that I really need to understand this space of the compulsive part because that's what's going to draw them in because that's the thing that they feel like, oh, that's the problem, but really that's the symptom, right? And all the other trauma. And for men, they're kind of the way they display the root problem is generally in some type of behavioral issue. You know, not all the time, but I mean, it's usually either a rage behavior, alcohol, weed, uh, drinking, sex, you know, and so I, I, I realized that, okay, if I want to focus on men, sexuality is going to be such a big piece here. And so that became the the genesis behind mm, getting yeah. trained in that space and really right, understanding right, right. that space. Cause I can't do the trauma work if I don't understand that part. Now, not, not all men present like that. Like I said, some men will just come and maybe have a drinking problem or maybe just an right. anger problem or just a depression, but a lot of them have that as well. Right. And can you, I guess, explain the difference or how it manifests differently sort of behavioral addictions like sexual compulsive addictions and maybe it's not different i don't know how you see it exactly between that and uh alcohol addiction or a drug addiction or that kind of thing do you see them much differently and and is the treatment much different generally no i think the treatment is basically identical outside of understanding the nuances of what triggers a guy uh, things to be mindful of, uh, you know, obviously getting them the right support groups, but the underground work is the same. I mean, the addiction is literally always, you know, engaging in a behavior to deal with emotional pain, right? And then experiencing consequences that persist and get worse, yet continuing the behavior, right? So that's the kind of framework of what attributes an addiction. So what whatever they're using to kind of medicate those painful feelings, you know, it'll be drugs, it'll be sex, it'll be weed, it'll be, you know, that's, and then in that space, let's say with the sex, oh, okay, I have to be mindful to ask about these questions. Whereas maybe I would never think about that with someone, you know, using marijuana or something else. Right. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking of, I remember, you, I can't remember what the context was. You were talking about when people are sharing their pornography habits or whatnot, sometimes you'll ask or you see the value in getting them to share as much as they can, right? Like what kind of porn yeah. are they watching? How much they're watching? All that kind of stuff. Um, can you talk maybe a bit about that and how hard that is for people and, and how? Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's an author called, uh, Michael Bader has a great book called uh, Arousal. And basically the idea behind, if someone's coming in with a porn addiction, at some point we're going to have to really uncover, well, what are they into? What are they watching? And so I, I want to make sure I'm being very clear, right? Because there's no definition on normative sexuality. I'm not here as a therapist telling a client, like, if you're watching porn, that's bad. Or if you're watching this much porn, Anything in the world of sex, as long as consensual, is all good. 
the clients I'm working with are reporting that this is bothering them. They don't feel good about this. They're experiencing consequences and they don't want to do this anymore, but they keep doing it. So I'm yeah. talking about yeah. that subset right now within that subset, it's really important for me to understand, hey, what is the type of pornography that you're being aroused by? Uh, because from that, sometimes we have access to something that they're solving for. So, you know, it could be a situation where, you know, they're into a power dynamic that's very important to them, that they're in the position of power. And then when you play it out, it's about the opposite of how they feel in their lives, completely powerless. And that's the kind of nugget that if we don't focus on that and where that comes from, the external part of it is not going to be able to get handled. So most of the people we work with, they struggle just trying to stop the behavior without kind of going deeper. But it's really important where or sometimes we'll see, um, I mean, a telltale sign with men who've been sexually abused is it moves into transsexual and then porn, which, again, for the subset that they have a problem with this. Right. There's a lot of how with men who have experienced sexual abuse they feel this brokenness in terms of their masculinity. And then transsexual for them feels safe because they feel like they're equally broken from their perspective. And so wow. you start to see kind of like a pattern emerge where sometimes if I meet a client early on and they tell me their pornography views, I already have an idea of, oh, I'm, I expect to hear this childhood trauma come up depending on the, the categories that I hear. Yeah, that's really insightful. Thank you. Yeah. And in, in, I assume that also relates to the sharing of the shame, right? And the de-shaming and the helping them kind of come out Big of that. Time. Right. Yeah. And because they're carrying yeah. whatever they're doing as if it's some kind of statement on them that right. what type of person does this, right? Maybe it's a power right, dynamic right, that they're right, uncomfortable right. with or whatnot, or maybe it's like the incest porn that is very popular to stage stuff and they're very uncomfortable with that. Uh, and then they go further in their shame because they believe oh, this says so much about me uh, when mm -hmm. really it says a lot about maybe your original pain, not your current pain. Right. And how do, or what are pathways out of that, I guess, for people? So they... I think we've covered a little bit of identifying sort of some of the core behaviors, et cetera, maybe some of the history behind that. And then how do, I know everyone's different, obviously, what are some general ways that people heal and, and learn to live differently, I guess. And, and maybe one last thing on that is I know in some of the 12 step sexual addiction pathways they have different understandings of what sobriety looks like i think right or what their yeah. new behavior looks like so can you maybe explain a bit of just how people heal and the different contexts um of that yeah so i mean there's two kind of primary 12-step groups there's one called sa sexaholics anonymous and one called saa sex addicts anonymous i think they're both very good uh sa they have a sobriety definition is primarily that you only have sex with your primary partner and you don't do anything else, including no masturbation or whatnot. And for them, that's sober living. And in SAA, you define what sexual sobriety is for you. So a guy might go in those rooms and has no problem watching porn, so that's fine, but he doesn't wanna be paying for sex or going on dating apps, looking for casual sex. And so for him, he puts mm -hmm. that as what they call his inner circle. So if he doesn't, pay for sex or go on dating apps for casual sex, he's sober even though he's watching porn. So you get to define that. Now, when I work with clients and the clients are having, you know, they've had success and they've gotten closer to the other side, I've always asked about ultimately what was the big change? What is it that you did that made a big difference for you? Now, the one, I mean, I just got this yesterday, but the one that I get all the time is what we spoke about earlier is when they committed to being with other men that are struggling with this. So they got into a group, they stopped trying to do this alone. That is, and I hear it all the time because there is also something incredible to realize that, oh my God, so many other guys 
are struggling with this and so many other guys have gotten to the other side. So whatever the group looks like, being in that environment, and it, it's also an admission that mm -hmm. I have a problem. So it, that thing is really powerful. The other one that I hear a lot about is referred to clinically as the metacognition. And so what my clients will tell me is that their internal voice about how they talk to themselves went from almost violent to really supportive and loving. And it's kind of like the goal is that therapeutic supportive voice or how I communicate with the clients is like, hey, how would you speak to your child if you had a child? And is that how you're speaking to yourself? Right. When they get to that place where they're starting to talk to themselves with that same language, we're closer to the other side. So those are the two kind of big ones. And then I think that the third one is obviously the emotional awareness. And by the emotional awareness, I mean, it's one thing to know you're feeling angry. You know, you mentioned, let's say, being in the line or being frustrated. But it's another thing to just do a little bit of work of like, what's under that? Like, what is this about for me? And maybe it's going to be, I'm never heard. Uh, people don't think I'm important. I'm not important. And really kind of starting to challenge that. Like, hey, wait, is that true? Like, is there another way to look at that? So, you know, if I would kind of, you know, go back to a younger self and kind of, you know, put the roadmap, you know, it would be like, hey, whatever you're trying to do, don't do it alone, um, you know. B, you're super violent with your internal voice. What would it look like to be gentle? And then C, you know, there's so much information in your emotions. You, it'd be a good idea to really just kind of tune into that rather than, mm. you know, try to brush it off. You know, those would be the three kind of, you know, biggies in a, in a more general way, I would imagine. Thank you. And any other kind of things that you find really fascinating about that kind of work in particular or topics you think that maybe even in the field of psychotherapy could be spoken about more, understood more, um, maybe even improving upon our treatment models? I don't know, any of that kind of stuff from, from this perspective of, of sex addiction treatment? I think... Uh... The thing I'm seeing a lot of lately that I really kind of I'm trying to um, move away from is we've got a lot of kind of younger men, maybe uh, early 20s, mid 20s, that they've come in with this idea of like a no porn solution. But there's something very kind of rigid about it. And so they might watch porn once a week, once a month. And they're devastated by the fact that they're watching that, that porn once a week, even though there's no consequence in their life outside of that feeling of devastation. And just to be mindful that sometimes, you know, that's really anxiety and not porn addiction, right? And, and I just kind of, because I see a lot of that where they come in and it's almost like from an anxiety point of view, they've created, okay, this is a certainty model, right? If I just never watch porn, you know, then my life will be X, right? <laughs> Which is, and, and so, and then, but sometimes people will treat them as like, well, this is a porn addiction and what's the strategy and what's, and a lot of times clients will come in and they will ask me, you know, and my advice, and I'll say, based on all the work I've done, if we've seen close to 3000 men at the clinic, I would not consider that a porn addiction and they get mad at me. And that's my telltale sign that, oh, this is probably not a porn addiction because I would think if someone went to a doctor and you thought you had cancer and then the doctor says you don't have cancer, that you'd be happy. You know what I mean? Right. But that's not the feeling that I get, right? <laughs> and so that's one of the things that I notice mm. because there's a lot more kind of information about sex and porn addiction. And I realize mm, there might be some people that are running too far with it, uh, yeah. right? Because I've never really liked the title. I much prefer like just sexual integrity, right? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help men live within their sexual integrity with whatever that means for them, right? Mm. Um, yeah. And so I'm not looking for like sexual rigidity, you know, which is kind of what that new age of 
kind of anti-porn I'm hearing. Right. And in to take that one thought a bit further in, in the the thought that if I just stop porn, then X, does that become, I think my thought is in the realm of anxiety or sort of, it's almost like an uh, obsession. And exactly. It, which, yeah, which comes from the anxiety kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So it, 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 I find, so usually when I see that now, I will ask just generally about, hey, do you mind if we talk a little bit about anxiety? How do you experience that? And usually there'll be tentacles there where, oh, there's going to be a history of anxiety or that's right. Because it, it's almost in an OCD-esque type of yeah. category. Right, right. Right. And just for if there's therapists listening, just to be mindful, if someone just comes and says, I have a porn addiction, you need to unpack what does that mean for them? Right. Don't just take it at face value and be like, oh, I have a porn addiction. OK, let's talk about that. Really, what does that mean to them? And then if you hear like I often hear, like, is it possible it might not be that? Right. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And OK, two other questions. Uh, one was, I remember you describing the moment of sexual exposure is sort of the ultimate vulnerability for men in particular. So whether that if they're struggling with like premature ejaculation or erectile dysfunction or like whatever the situation is, in order for them to heal from that in some sense, I don't know exactly, I'm sure there's different ways, but the thought I'm asking about is sort of exposure in some sense, right? So they, in order to be okay with their vulnerability, do they need exposure? So I, so maybe another example would be some, say someone's dating, and I've heard this story before, um, a guy is dating a girl, it starts to get sexual, he has premature ejaculation, and then he ends up avoiding sex because either he doesn't want to feel the shame of that or he's scared to talk about it with the girl, something like that. Is that a common thing? And then, or I don't know if common, if that even matters, but how, I assume you've heard that before or something like that. How do men or how do you help men work through that? I mean, so the, the definition basically of intimacy is allowing oneself to be fully seen by another person. Right. Okay. And so often what happens, um, let's take kind of compulsive sexual behavior. The reason it's so magnetic is because the individual who's engaging in it doesn't like who they believe themselves to be. Right. So intimacy in a traditional sense for most people maybe would be enjoyable, but for these men, that's risky. Right. So where they're going to go is they're going to go to what I refer to as transactional based intimacy, whether it's casual, anonymous, you pay for it, because the benefit is there's no risk of exposure. So if I believe myself to be not worthy, not good, right, an intimate environment, which is allowing myself to be fully seen, would be a high risk proposition. So I'm going to be magnetically kind of drawn to environments where I don't have to expose myself and they don't expose themselves transactional. So now if someone's presenting with some type of sexual dysfunction, right? Really, we're going to have to unpack what's going on for them that there might be something with the intimacy that's very scary and they want to kind of get out of, right? And, and so, and then once we kind of kind of start working through that, then they're going to have to obviously get to the work of exposure, meaning they're going to have to get back in that situation. But it's just being mindful that, hey, let's just take a look at, it sounds like there's something here about allowing yourself to be fully seen outside of just the fact that you had this experience that you're like, well, I don't want them to see that experience. Yeah, we know, but what's more there? Um, hmm. that, that's the kind of paradigm, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And so then the, the skill in some sense is being more vulnerable in more domains of their life where they might be hiding in and exactly. like alongside that, something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, you know, any kind of work around sexual dysfunction is hard work because it takes time and nobody yeah. likes that. Like if you're working <laughs> with a male population, I mean, they're going to come in, they'll come and sit with yeah. you as a therapist. So this is the issue. What do I do now? 
Right. And like, you know what? It takes, it takes a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work. Right. Right. Wow. Uh, I guess what that's what the blue pill, uh, is trying to help people with, I yeah, guess, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's erectile like, dysfunction. Like, no, the blue pill is helpful too. Right. Because sometimes it's physiological. <laughs> Right. Okay. And I yeah, have to yeah, make yeah, that yeah. clear, right? Where, hey, you right, want to get right, checked right. out to make sure you rule right. that out. But... Right, right. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to ask you another, this idea I think you would talk about around how do, how are men expressing their sexual energy or something like that, or their, their masculinity or their manhood or whatnot, or, and that question of what does it mean to be a man? I think you would often ask, or what does it mean to you? to be a man or something like that you would ask that question yeah, I, I mean I'll, sometimes. usually i'll prompt that question just to get a sense of like what's the shame that they're carrying right um and so or can you describe a couple different examples of that well i mean so for example i might ask someone you know in the course of whatever we're doing i might say so how do you feel about yourself as a man and i might hear a uh, loser i might hear weak I might hear inadequate, and that gives me kind of an angle to take a look at, right? In terms of, um, you know, where's that coming from? What's that about? You know, what's the trauma connected with that core belief? Right. And then, okay. And I, I know we're sort of getting to the end of our time. So there's one question I'd like from one, anything that as a, again, maybe as a, you already gave an answer to the therapy kind of question, but maybe as a society, or as just like an ethos around healthy sexuality or ha healthy manhood, any sort of topics, questions that you don't think are being discussed enough or that you would like to see discussed more? I mean, if anything, when you say topics in terms of like issues that men are struggling with or? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah, I think, yeah, in the realm of sort of men's mental health and healthy sexuality and in that umbrella. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd love to see more focus on like when I unpack the work that I'm doing, I basically always tell people I'm trying to help men be more loving, you know, not in a sentimental way, just in a really genuine and just like more on that. Like, what does that actually look like? We do, we do so much good work around like, uh, you know, all the bad stuff, you know, like don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Yeah. But right. it'd be nice to have kind of more about, Hey, what is it? What does that look like? And, and a lot of men are doing it and we just maybe more talk on that would be, uh, refreshing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Can you share a bit about what that means to you? I mean, this is, uh, no, I mean, listen, this is really, you know, the, when I wake up and I focus and I, I get up, you know, and I, I journal, it's really about, that's what this is about. So for me, it's about, you know, how can I, you know, I have a, a story with my, uh, with my, my client. So I have a nephew I'm very close with and, he went through a very difficult childhood. And when I would, when I was younger, I used to pray that he's going to need therapy one day. And please, I don't give a shit about the skill of the therapist. I just, all I want is that the therapist cares about my nephew because that will deal with any lack of skill. So just care about this. Kid. And so that, that story usually in our practice is we, I tell all the, the therapists I work with because the first thing I do prior to meeting a new client, literally, and this is without fail, the moment before I open up the screen or meet them in person, I tell myself, so my nephew's name is Nicholas. I tell myself, this is someone's Nicholas. Just do whatever you can do to bring that heart, right? Because I'm not the best therapist in terms of all the skills and all that, but the heart I can bring. And so I try to do that. But then for me, what does that look like in my daily life? And so, uh, you know, that could be as simple as, you know, getting an email from, you know, just a regular whatever transactional thing where I maybe I'm a little upset and like, can I approach this in a more loving way? And so, I mean, that's my orientation, but that's meaningful to me, right? Like in yeah, terms yeah, of yeah, yeah. this gives me meaning in my life. So I do it with joy, you know, but uh that's my focus. Thank you. That was beautiful. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you. That was really nice. Um, I appreciate your time and your wisdom and all that kind of stuff and all the great work you are doing. Thank you. Mike. And uh, yeah. So all your info will be in the show notes for people to check out and all that kind of stuff. So 
I'll just hit stop here and I'll say goodbye. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.